All the kiddos getting their bags. Cool, cool, cool. I am glad you are here today. I am, uh, wow. I heard a parent say no running. Right. <laughs> Good luck with that. We like kids to run in our church. I've got uh, some friends who are missionaries, and they always say when they come back from the mission field, if they come to our church first, it ruins their kids for all the other churches they have to visit, um, which I'm glad of that. Uh, we're glad you're here today. I'm glad that you've decided to come and worship with us and learn today as we start a new series entitled, she's very excited about her bag, um, there you go, a new series entitled Sent. There is a tagline underneath of this entitled, The Good News of Jesus Resurrection. Um, I'm going to go ahead and let you know, uh, last weekend I had kind of an allergy fun stuff. Did y'all know that pollen is ridiculous right now? Anybody's car green this morning when you got up? Uh, last weekend I had fun with that and then preaching last Sunday, lost my voice most of the week. Um, so I'm going to maintain at this level. Um, Kyle, uh, I gave him all the message notes this week. If at any point during the message, y'all just see me walk off, we're going to tag team and he's going to come out and finish it up and it'll be fine. But I made it through first service, so we're going to pray we make it through this one. Um, so anyway, we're going to dig into this series entitled Sent this morning. Last Sunday was, uh, was Easter Sunday. Did y'all know that? How many of you had ham last week? I, I'm doing a quick survey. How many of you had ham? Um, I don't know what else you eat other than ham on Easter Sunday. It feels like the non-Jewish thing to do, so we should do it, right? Because the Jews still celebrate the Sabbath day on Saturdays, but because of grace and because of Jesus resurrecting on the first day of the week, we get to eat ham. Oh yeah, and come to church on Sundays. But we get to eat ham, amen. Um, deviled eggs, anybody do deviled eggs? Uh, we had a combination of deviled eggs and Reese's eggs, and... Um, and don't mix them together. But, uh, but anyway, it, it was good. Easter's fun. Um, for me, Easter Sunday is, is kind of like the big day of the year. Everything we do, what I just said a minute ago, the reason we worship on Sundays is because of Easter, because Jesus rose from the dead on the first day of the week. Really, the reason we continue to worship on Sunday, we should actually have Easter every Sunday. That's what we should do, right? All right, matter of fact, let me, start, let me do it this way. Good morning. Welcome to Easter Sunday at Living Water. That's, that's what it is every Sunday. But Easter Sunday has all the celebration, all of the, we recognize the resurrection of Jesus. We talked about the cross last week and that, that message. And, and here we find ourselves after the resurrection. There was no, there was no more singular important event in all of history than the resurrection. See, everything changed because of the resurrection. If, if Jesus would have lived his life and said, I'm going to rise again, and didn't, then we wouldn't have any hope. But because Jesus died, and three days later he rose again, everything changes for all of us. Everything. Now, I'm aware you may not be a Christian this morning, and this whole idea of scent that I'm going to talk about, you, you, you may not want to go anywhere because you really don't know who Jesus is yet, and we want to introduce you to him this morning, and, and really, there's no catch in what we're going to do. We want to tell you about Jesus. If you are a Christian this morning, our, our response, the reason that Jesus left us, wouldn't it be cool? Let, 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 listen, wouldn't it be cool? If the moment we got saved, we just went poof and went straight to heaven right then. Wouldn't that be great? We wouldn't have to worry about anything, no troubles, no, no, no issues, no stuff. Some of y'all want your kids to get saved now so they'll poof on out and you won't have to worry about them anymore. And, and I get it. But, but that's not what God did. He left us here on purpose. Matter of fact, God left us here as sent people. We are to live our lives as if we were commissioned by Jesus himself. Matter of fact, that word commission we find in our Bibles, we find it in recordings from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Jesus left a, um, a commission to his disciples. You're probably familiar with it. Let me, let me read it to you. In Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter 28, <clears throat> verse 16, listen, listen to these words. Um, Jesus said this. He said, then the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus told them to go. 
when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. That, that's always interesting to me, but some doubted. So, so think about this. Jesus died like he said he was going to. He rose again like he said he was going to. He's standing with his disciples, and there's still people there doubting. I, I don't get that, but okay, it's recorded for us. Some doubt it. <clears throat> then Jesus came to them, and he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Everything was given to me, and now I'm going to commission you to do something with the authority that was given to me. So in verse 19, he says, therefore, go and make disciples. Everybody say go. Go, go. That means we're sent to do something. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to do everything I commanded you, and surely I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus says that we are to live lives that are sent by him. It's recorded for us in the book of Acts, which is really the last act of Jesus and all the acts of the apostles. That Jesus, it's recorded this way in Acts 1.8. It says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my, what's that word? Say that word. Witnesses. Do you know what a witness is? A witness is somebody who has first-hand knowledge of an event. A witness is somebody who has seen or heard of the event, and they are now witnesses to something that happened. Do we recognize that in the early church, all they talked about was the resurrection? It didn't matter if you believe that, that God created the earth in seven days or if there was a big bang in heaven. It didn't matter if, if you believe this, that or the other thing. The only thing that really mattered was the resurrection. And the disciples and the ones that were there, it's actually recorded for us that about 500 people um, outside of the disciples had seen Jesus alive after he died. The resurrection was so key and so important. And Jesus says, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. We can't do the Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth unless we live lives that are sent by God. Every single one of us who claim that we are Christians, our life on this earth does not exist just for us. We are to live lives that are sent. So that's what we're going to be talking about today and in the coming weeks in this series, what this really looks about, looks like. So if we're supposed to live lives that are sent, and that's the way that we're supposed to be living, how do we do this? Was there any chance that, that, that Jesus left clues for us? Kind of like we, we do these family worship guides when we have our family Sundays and we ask these questions. Those are kind of clues and things that we're going to talk about during the message. And, you know, if we could give all the kids magnifying glasses and you could, you know, play detective or Scooby-Doo and get Scooby snacks, that'd be really cool. Um, if we could do these things. Um, Maybe Jesus left some clues. Maybe he left some ideas. And, and, and maybe here's one. In Matthew chapter 22, and I'm going to be in different scriptures this morning, so go ahead and, and, and know that. Um, the scriptures will be up on the screen. If you've got your smartphone, you can go to mylivingwater.cc, to the sermon notes, follow along, however you want to. Um, but let me give you this. In Matthew 22, it, it's like Jesus gave us this, um, uh, this clue this idea of how we live our lives sent. L listen to the words of Jesus. He was talking and he was questioned as he often was. And one particular man questioned him. And he asked him, he said, Jesus, what's the greatest commandment in the world? And Jesus gave this answer. Maybe you're familiar with it. It's on something you're going to talk about later on, kids. So listen to this one, all right? Jesus replied to that question with this. Love the Lord your God. With all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. The second one is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then I, I love this. I, lo I love that Matthew puts these words in here. He says, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And in other words, what, what, what's being said is this. All of the Jewish tradition... All of the, um, what we call Jewish history or the Old Testament, every bit of that is completed in love God and love your neighbor. Love God and love your neighbor. This love your neighbor aspect is the aspect of living a life that is sent 
Now, people have asked, they ask in, in stories in the Bible, they ask Jesus. Matter of fact, his disciples one time said, well, Jesus, if we're supposed to love our neighbors, who exactly is our neighbor? Jesus tells a story you might be familiar with of the Good Samaritan, and he uses a story about who's your neighbor. There's so many times it's recorded. Basically, if I can get in your mind, when I say love your neighbor, your neighbor is um, uh, everybody. <laughs> All right? So who's your neighbor? And now, don't say everybody. We got to get a little motto and a little slang in here, all right? You ready? Who's your neighbor? Everybody. everybody, all right? Everybody. That's how you say it, all right? It's everybody. It's everyone. That means your neighbor could be the person when you go to lunch today. It could be the waiter or the waitress that waits on you. It could be the person at the checkout line. It could be the person that you work with. Um, really, technically, your neighbor could actually be your spouse, and you're like, well, I'm not going to love them. I, I, but that's all right. God says, love him and love your neighbor. And your neighbor's everybody. So if we're supposed to love everybody and we're supposed to live lives that are sent, how does all this stuff work together? How do we love people like God? And how do we live a life that is sent? Let me give you something I was reading and ran across this week. There was a recent poll that said 87% of Americans say that they believe in God. 87% of Americans say they believe in God. That means if you've got 10 friends, 8 to 9 of them say they believe in God. Now, that doesn't mean that they go to church. It doesn't mean that they believe in Jesus. It doesn't mean that they're particularly religious. It just means that that. 8 out of 10, 8 to 9 out of 10, 87% of people in America say that they believe in God. If most people believe in God, that's your friends, that's your neighbors, and your neighbor is everybody. If that's your neighbor, and if most people say they believe in God, what I think they need more than anything else is somebody they can trust to help them. Somebody that they can trust to help them find their way. Over the next few weeks of this series, I'm going to introduce you into ways that I believe that Jesus lived a life that was sent. And he models for us what it is to be sent so that we can live lives that are sent. There's um, a, a survey that I ran across, and I'm going to use a couple of these this morning, but it was a, a Barna research poll, and they're going to put it up on the screen for me. In a recent Barna research poll, people were asked what they value most in a person they would talk to about spiritual matters. So this is the, the eight to nine out of 10 people who say they believe in God. Um, what is it that they value the most in a person that talks to them about spiritual matters? See, for a long time, as, as, as church people, we felt like it was our responsibility to go out into the world and convince people of what we're doing. I don't know if you know this or not, but people don't want to be convinced. They just want to know you. <laughs> so this research they gave, and I'll put them up there, and you might find these interesting or maybe not, all right? Um, the top three answers to what people said they'd value most in a person that would talk to them about spiritual things is this. Number one, um, they're looking for people that will listen to them without judgment. Did you catch that? Listening to them without judgment. Two-thirds of the people surveyed, two-thirds of the people surveyed said that no one in their lives would listen to them without judgment. You know what that makes me think? That maybe thinks, makes me think that maybe Christians are more interested in talking than we are in listening. Maybe the reason that people don't want to become a Christian or maybe the, people, the reason that people don't want to give their lives to God and follow him more closely is because for years the church has been known better for what we're against than what we're for. Because we don't do a good job listening without judgment. I've got to tell you honestly, God has been working on this area in my life tremendously in the last, I don't know, 10, 12 years or so, especially the last few years. Just listening to people, let them tell their story. It's my, not my job to convert someone to the way that I believe. It is my job to love them, to listen to them and point them to God. So the number one thing that people look for is somebody to listen to them without judgment, which takes me to the number two thing out of the top three. Um, people are looking for someone who will allow them to draw their own conclusions. See, um, <clears throat> if you're a Christian this morning, 
um, you are indwelt. That's, that's kind of a crazy word, all right? You are indwelt by God's Holy Spirit. That means you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. Did you know that? Some of you are like, oh, crap. All right, you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you if you're a Christian this morning. That is real. Um, if you are a Christian this morning, the Holy Spirit's living inside of you. Um, does the Holy Spirit let you know when you've done something wrong, when you've sinned? Does the Holy Spirit let you know? Does he? I, I know he does me. If there's something in my life or I've said something I shouldn't say or done something I shouldn't do or, or, or talked about, whatever it may be, the Holy Spirit will let me know pretty quickly. Here's something that I've had to learn over the years. Do you know? It's going to be crazy, all right? This is really, really crazy, all right? Um, if the Holy Spirit can tell me when I'm doing something wrong, this is crazy. He can actually tell other people when they're doing something wrong. Did you know that? Did you know that the same Holy Spirit that lives in me is the same Holy Spirit that works to convict and bring other people to salvation? It is not my job to draw conclusions in people's lives. God's given me incredible opportunities over the last few years to hang out with groups of people who think differently about really important things like sexuality or what they believe or, or is there other ways to get to heaven or different things. And you know what I've really, really learned by sitting with this, these people? is I sit there with them and I keep my mouth shut and I let them draw their own conclusions. Now, when they ask me a question, I get to interject. But I just let people be people and I trust the Holy Spirit. Now, listen, that's not a cop-out. That's not a reason for us to go, well, I guess we might as well not tell anybody about Jesus because it's just the Holy Spirit, so we should just keep our mouth shut. No, you're supposed to tell everybody. But you don't, you don't have to be a jerk about it. <laughs> There's enough jerks running around. We don't have to be that way. So number one, listen without judgment is what people are looking for. Number two, allowing people to draw their own conclusions. And then I love this. Number three, people are looking for people that have confidence in sharing their own perspective. Now, now, listen, some of you this morning, you might be sitting there going, well, I don't know all the Bible verses, so I can't tell anybody about Jesus. I, I, I think I know John 3.16. It says something about God loving the world and sins and crosses and stuff like that. And I think I know that one. I know there's a verse in the Bible that says we've all sinned. And I remember my mom saying, spare the rod, spoil the something. I don't remember what that was. Or, or my mom used to quote, I'm going to beat you if you do this. I'm not sure if that was in the Bible, but, but I think I knew that one. But listen, you don't have to know all the verses. There's something incredible about a changed life. Matter of fact, let me give you a statement, and it's on your notes, and you'll see it on the screen. Your story, the story that you have, is the best evidence that you can offer anyone. You don't have to know the exact address of every verse in the Bible. You don't even have to know any verses in the Bible. If God has changed your life, if there has been a change inside of you that has taken place where you once were lost and now you're found, you once were blind but now you can see, you were once in a place that was far from God and now you're close to God, guess what? That is the very best evidence you can ever offer in telling someone about Jesus. So, tell them. Share your story. I, I'm in our, we're, our church, we're in our second round of mentoring. Mentoring has been something that, man, I can't, I, I'm just so excited what God's doing with it. Mentoring is where a group of people, men or, or women, they get with a mentor and they commit to something. I mean, this is crazy in church world, all right? They commit to nine months, nine months of reading books and memorizing scripture and, and being accountable to one another. My very favorite month in the entire mentoring process is, this is my second time through it with guys, um, is the second month. The reason I love the second month is that's when you gather together and everybody tells their story. Everybody tells what it is that God's brought them out of, what it is that God's doing in their life. They share their struggles. They share their, their hang-ups. Let me go CR on you. Their hurts, their habits, and their hang-ups. They, they share that kind of stuff. And what happens in the middle of that is when people share their stories, something incredible happens. You get to see God in the middle of their story. And do you know what everybody wants is for Christians to be real people? Everybody does. They want us to be authentic. 
Um, listen, I've had the privilege of pastoring here for quite a while now and being on staff here and being in ministry for a long time. I'm not going to be the pastor here forever. There will be someone else pastoring here one day. It will happen. By the way, there will be someone else driving your car one day unless you total it. Um, all that's, It happens. There's changes in life, okay? But here is one of my prayers and one of my hopes and one of the things that I ask God all the time, that when the time comes that I'm no longer the pastor here, people will look back and they will go, that was the most authentic guy that led people to be authentic in their lives. Because I don't mind sharing with you my struggles. I'll share with you about an addiction that I had pornography for years. A few weeks ago, my wife and I got up here and we shared about the fact that she's been diagnosed with breast cancer. And, and we shared with you, hey, please walk with us and pray with us. And I told you how much we trust our doctors and our team. And, and I'm so excited that none of y'all came to us and said, hey, my dog's heartworm medicine will help cure cancer. All right, thank you for not doing that. Um, but, but we wanted to be authentic and real with our lives lives. My, my poor kids who've grown up in my house their whole lives, they want me to be less real when I tell stories about them. But, but listen, our, our kids aren't perfect and neither are yours. They say as a preacher's kid, you live in a glass house. Well, I decided to shatter the glass so my kids wouldn't get cut. They'll be fine. The world wants us. Everybody wants us to be real. There's one time that Jesus was talking, and remember, we're trying to learn some of these things, and, and, and when Jesus was talking, he came to this sort of conclusion. You know what people want more than anything else? People want, they want friends. They real, real, real authentic people in their lives, and if we're going to live lives that are sent, uh, listen to this. There was one time that Jesus was, uh, he was hanging out with, with uh, most, mostly religious people. There were some of his followers that were around, and the religious people began to talk to him about his cousin, um, John the Baptist. Anybody familiar with John the Baptist? You know who John the Baptist is? That's his crazy cousin. Now, y'all got a crazy cousin? I'm telling you, John the Baptist, it tells us that he wore um, a, a coat made out of camel hair. Have y'all ever been to a pet zoo and smelled a camel? I mean, I feel like Walmart let John the Baptist down. Was there not like a good cotton poly blend somewhere he could have gotten? I mean, John the Baptist must have smelled like a camel is what he must have smelled like. And now on top of that, he lived out in the woods and he ate bugs. Was what, and, and, and Jesus was talking about him. Jesus was talking about John the Baptist and he said, you didn't like what he had to say because my cousin, he wouldn't eat or drink with you. He was eating bugs and smelling camels, I guess. But he wouldn't eat or drink with you. And then you're mad at me because I will eat and drink. And, and it was crazy because the religious people started giving Jesus a nickname. Now listen to this. Um, in Matthew 11 verse 19, Jesus is talking and he says, The son of man came eating and drinking. And they say, here is a glutton and a drunkard. He is a friend of tax collectors and sinners. The religious community started talking about Jesus and they would say, he's a friend of sinners. Those sinners over there. Jesus is a friend of sinners. We're not sinners. They're sinners over there. Not y'all's side of the church. They're just sinners over there. Maybe. Um, they're just sinners. They started calling Jesus a friend of sinners so much that I think somewhere along the way, Jesus was like, I'll take that nickname. That sounds good. So Jesus refers to himself and says, I am a friend of sinners. I love the fact that we don't worship a God who sits somewhere that has no interest in our lives. He even recognizes that if he's going to be around us, he's going to have to hang around with sinners. Because there's none of y'all that hadn't sinned. Me neither. Jesus was a friend of sinners. But you know what the best word in that is? He was a friend. That's what living a life sent means. It means getting out of this building, not right now until I finish, <laughs> but getting out of this building and being friends with people and blessing people's lives. See, Jesus, everywhere he went, everybody he talked to, everybody he talked to, he made friends and he blessed them. When he met Andrew and his brother Peter, Simon Peter, he became friends with them. And then he called them into ministry and told them, you're going to become fishers of men. He made friends with a tax collector by the name of Zacchaeus. 
We'll talk about him in a minute. He blessed Zacchaeus when he became friends and had a meal at his house. He made friends with a Samaritan woman one time who had five husbands in the past. And the one she was with was not her husband. She was so outcast by her community that she couldn't even go out in the mornings and draw water the way the rest of the women did. She had to go in the afternoon because I'm sure the the, the women's uh, mission prayer group wasn't excluding her. So she had to come at noon. You know what Jesus did? He became her friend. And then he blessed her. Matter of fact, that woman at the well was one of the very first people that ever announced, come see the Messiah, the one who told me everything I've ever done. That's a blessing. One of my favorite, favorite, favorite illustrations of Jesus being a friend and blessing was when it came to children. Do you know the stories of Jesus with children? If you've ever, um, how many of y'all been watching the, sh- the, uh, the series, The Chosen? Have you seen The Chosen? If you haven't seen it, I would encourage you, not right now because I'm preaching, but in a while, download the app. As a matter of fact, if you want to do it now, go ahead and just check Facebook while you're on there, all right? Um, there's an app called The Chosen. You can also find it on some streaming services on TV and stuff like that. But um, it, they do a fantastic job depicting Jesus and the disciples. And I think they're done with season two and they're working on season three now. But anyway, there's a particular scene early on in the series where Jesus is uh, traveling and the kids kind of get curious around him and Jesus makes friends with the kids. Now Jesus was serious about being friends with children. So much so that one time Jesus, before he was teaching, the children came around and they wanted to play with him and jump on his lap and I imagine Jesus was probably a really good tickle monster and I bet he had a lot of fun with kids. So much so the disciples came up one time and they were like, Jesus, we gotta, we got to remove the children so that you can teach because you're the Messiah. And Jesus, I can, I can just imagine, Jesus turned and he said, don't you dare keep a kid away from me. These are my friends. And then Jesus went a little overboard. He said, if any of you try to keep a kid away from me, you might as well tie an anchor around your neck and jump in the middle of the pond. That's what I'm going to do. I think Jesus liked kids. What do you think? He made friends with them and he blessed them. Everywhere he went, everywhere Jesus went, he made friends and he blessed. That's what it means to live a sent life. I I, I found a, a quote out of a book I was reading this week and it said this. It said, Jesus proved that if you are a good friend who blesses people, you don't have to sell them anything or trick them into doing anything. Instead, they just want to be around you. You know what that is in, in the best kind of jargon I can possibly say? That's Christians not being jerks. That's just being friends. So what if we learn from Jesus, this idea of being sent? What if we learn to bless people? What if this whole idea of being sent is, is uh, more about being a friend and less about condemning people and trying to convert them to something. Love God. Love your neighbor. Everybody. What if that's what it's about? Over the next few weeks in this series, we're gonna, I'm going to teach you an acrostic. An acrostic is, if you don't know what it is, it's the, it's the, um, you take, the take the, the word and the first letter or the letters of each word, make out a statement of some kind. I'm going to teach you one. Um, the acrostic that we're going to use over the next few weeks is the word bless. Put that up on the screen for me. B-L, there's one, two, three, five. There'll be five things that are in there, all right? Sorry, math and English just doesn't work well for me, all right? Bless. Everybody say Bless. Now listen, this is, not, this is not the southern version. Jesus didn't walk around going, well, bless their heart. All right, that's, that's, not, that's like the, you know, the comforting way of saying you're dumb. That's, that's not what you're doing, all right? This idea of blessing and being a friend, it's, it's something we can do as Christians. It's a way that we can live a sent life. Jesus actually did this. Jesus did it, I, I mentioned the guy earlier, the, the tax collector, the, the guy who was a sinner that everybody looked down on. Luke, um, one of the writers of the Gospels in the Bible, um, Luke, who was a doctor and he had researched before he put his stories together in a book named after him. He tells, tells this story, and I'm going to hang here for a second. In Luke chapter 19, look at this. Uh, Luke records it this way. He says, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. 
Now, the, the reason that I, I underlined and put passing through, because you need to know something about Jesus. Jesus wasn't going to Jericho. He, he, was, he was going somewhere else. He was on his way when he found someone that he could become a friend to and that he could bless. That means that Jesus didn't wake up that morning and open his Google calendar and go, hey, on the way to Jericho, I'm going to do this, 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 and this. No, what Jesus did is he looked for the opportunity in his life, and he lived a life that made him sent, and he wants us to live the kind of lives that make us sent so that everywhere we go, some of you can't wait for me to be done because you're going to go to a restaurant and eat. There's going to be a waiter or a waitress that didn't get to go to church this morning, and there's going to be a waiter or a waitress that's going to be standing in a restaurant waiting for you. And the majority of waiters and waitresses don't want to work on Sundays because that's when the Christians all come to eat. Because churches and Christians have a bad reputation with restaurants. Because we come in because we've been sitting for a while and we worship Jesus so that we can be ticked off at the waiter and the waitress. By the way, if you come to Living Water and you heard me this morning, you better tip your waiter and waitress this afternoon. All right? Yeah. Listen, don't, don't you just throw, and God forbid you ever write on the bottom of a receipt, Jesus paid it all, amen? Don't you do that. I hope somebody jack slaps you if you do that. <laughs> Listen, the best way that you can tell a waiter or, waiter, waiter or waitress about Jesus is tip them well for what they're doing. That was a free sermon in the middle of a sermon. That was good. You're going to run across people today. You're going to run across people in checkout lines. You're going to go to work tomorrow. Some of your everybody's going to be at work tomorrow. Some of your everybody's going to be at a restaurant. Some of your everybody's might be something that you're not expecting. I was praying this week as I was working on this message, and I'm, I'm going to share the acrostic with you here in a few minutes, but one of the things as I was praying the other morning, I said, okay, God, I, I just put somebody in my path today. Put somebody in my path. I was the first one who got here to church that morning, and I pulled up in the parking lot, and there was a car broke down right up on the front of the parking lot, and I pulled in coming around to where I usually park and went, well, God, there's my body. So I turned back around, I went over there, and it was a young guy, and his battery wouldn't, wouldn't work, and, and I said, man, can I help you? And he goes, yeah. Yeah, can, can, you, can you give me a jump? And he pulled out some jumper cables that <laughs> were really, really bad, like bare, bare wires and no clamps on them. And I was going, I got some jumper cables. I think it'll work better with mine. So I got out, and we got his car started, we got in a little conversation a little bit, and I, listen, he, he didn't like fall on his knees and repent and give his life to Jesus, but I just talked to him, and we'll see what God does. As Jesus was passing through, a man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. Y'all remember Zacchaeus, right? Did y'all go to vacation Bible school or Sunday school when you was a little kid? Come on, help me out. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. Wee little man was he. Somebody in the first service started doing the hand motions. All oh, y'all just ain't doing that, all right? He climbed, there's one, all right? He climbed up in the sycamore tree for the Lord. He, that was Zacchaeus, all right? I, I bet he is so proud in heaven right now that we made that song about him. Um, it was a tax collector, a man by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, not just a tax collector. He was a chief. That means he had other people underneath of him. And then it says that he was wealthy. Now, let me see if I can get this in your mind correctly so that you go. He was a sinner, but he was a, a tax collector, which was really, really looked bad at in those days. Um, if you were in like the, the, if you had to pay 35% of your income for taxes, if you found or fell into that region, what Zacchaeus would do is he would charge you 50% and he would pocket 15% of it. Um, so that's who Zacchaeus was. Nobody liked him. He was an ebb body, but nobody liked him, all right? He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, I love that little part in the Bible, <laughs> little part, isn't that good? All right. all right, he was short. He could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead, and he climbed up in a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. See, Jesus was just passing through. The opportunity arose for him to do something. Notice that Jesus just passing through, he could have easily missed Zacchaeus. He was not blessed with height, <laughs> but he didn't. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, come on down here. I think that's how he said it. It's recorded, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and he welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he's gone to be a guest of the sinners. Here he 
he goes again. Sinners. But you know what? Jesus said, I don't care who you are. I don't care where you're from. I don't care what your background is. I was sent for you. And guess what he wants us to do? He wants us to live lives that are sent. And I love Jesus' proclamation about Zacchaeus in verse 8. Zacchaeus, who when he found Jesus and when Jesus saved him, he decided, hey, I'm going to do this and do it right. Zacchaeus stood up and he said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I'll pay them back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, and what an incredible proclamation. Jesus said, today, salvation has come to this house. Because this man, too, is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost, living a life that was sent. I'm going to give you what this acrostic is. They're going to put it up on the screen for me. And I'll read over them. You can see all five of them that are there. But I, I just want to help you because we're going to be using this over the next few weeks. And listen, I am one of those guys who went to Bible school and I've been in church my entire life. And I can lead you to the Lord in 17 different strategies. Um, I've done every single evangelism strategy that's out there. I've memorized all the verses and all the quotes and everything that needs to be done. And what I consistently come back to is when I can get in a relationship with somebody, I can point them to Jesus. That may start with giving a guy a jump in his car. It may start with tipping a waiter or a waitress well. It may start with whoever the everybody's are in my life today and tomorrow. Then I start doing this. Here's, here's the acrostic. Number one, uh, begin with prayer. Um, well, it seems like a kind, of a kind of a theme throughout this year, doesn't it? We started our year with um, 21 days of fasting and prayer. We went into another series called Dangerous Prayer where we decided we were going to pray, God search me, God break me, and God send me. And a lot of you have done that. What would it look like if right now, I'm not telling you to wait till tomorrow morning, what would it look like right now if you said, okay, God, I'm listening to this message, I want to be challenged. Right now, God, whoever the everybody is that you put in my life today, Give me the opportunity. What would change? What do you think would change if our entire church, first service too, I know they're not here right now, but if, if our entire church started this way, right now, not tomorrow morning, right now, hey God, I'm going to live a life that's sent. So I'm going to begin this way. God, help me, to, help me to be observant of whoever you put in my path. I'm going to begin with prayer. So that's the first one. Begin with prayer. Number two is listen. Um, do you know that uh, there was something that I found that uh, according, people have searched this out and they're smarter than I am. That uh, according to what some scholars have said, Jesus was asked 183 recorded questions in the New Testament. 183 questions. Out of the 183 questions that Jesus was asked, he answered about 10 to 12 of them. Jesus was more interested in listening to people than he was in telling them. What would it look like? What would it look like if we just started listening to people? If, if, listen, people are allowed to have their own opinions. They don't have to be right, but they're allowed to have their own opinions. I don't know if you know this or not, but about half the time, you're wrong. <laughs> hey, listen, the world wouldn't be better if we all thought the same, because then we'd all be wrong. What if we just begin to listen to people? You, you want to have a relationship? You want to live a life that is sent? Begin with prayer. And then listen. Um, I love the third one. This brings out the Southern Baptist in all of us. Eat. You know why Eat is on there? The, the guys who put this together, um, they're two brothers. I think it's John and Dan Ferguson. They wrote um, this whole concept of blessing, and they wrote a book about it, and it's really cool. They were church planners who had been like me. They'd been first in every single strategy, and they really realized that it's about relationships. And I love that they put eat on here because they, they made a statement in their book and they said, when we sit together with someone and we eat, there is no more engaging time with people than when you share a meal. Jesus did it over and over. The story of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus. He said, come down out of the tree. I'm going to eat at your house today. So follow the path here, right? Follow the steps. Hey, God, put somebody in my path today. That may be all that God does. He puts somebody in your path today and you get to have a conversation and you listen. Build that relationship. Maybe eventually it'll turn into a time where you can sit and share a meal or just engage them wherever they are. The next thing is serve. It doesn't take long to figure out what somebody needs. I don't know if you know that or not. 
But get in a conversation with somebody. By the way, if you want to be able to serve somebody where they need to be served, you better learn how to listen up front. Um, Their stories are really good. Listen to them and then serve them. Figure out a way you can serve them. And then the final thing is the one I've shared several times. Share your story. You'll know when it's right. You'll know when the time is to share your story and what you need to say. Um, If we can do that, if we can begin to live a life that is sent, and if we choose every day to begin with prayer, to listen to people, to look for an opportunity to engage or to eat a meal with them, to serve people, and to share stories, I believe what we're going to find is exactly what Jesus wanted from us, and that is lives that are lived sent. There's an author that I came across this week, and she made an incredible statement, and I copied it, and I'm going to put it up on the screen for you. Her name is Madeline Engel. She um, said these words. She said, we draw people to Christ not by loudly discrediting what they believe, by telling them how wrong they are and how right we are, but by showing them a light that is so lovely that they want with all their hearts to know the source of it. Huh. What if it wasn't about us trying to convince somebody or convert somebody? What if it was really, really about what Jesus said? Love God and love everybody. What if that's really what it's about? Think of it this way. Living like we're sent means, it means we look to bless others. They're going to put that on the screen for me. Living like we're sent means we look to bless others. We, we, we look to find those opportunities. What would change? What would change in your life? If today, when you left here today, you said, God, put somebody in my path I can bless. I, I began with prayer. I'm going to listen. God, I'm going to look for an opportunity to engage them. I'm going to serve them. And I'm going to look for an opportunity to share my story because that's the greatest evidence of change in my life is my story. What would it look like? on the end of your worship guide this morning, especially for our kids. Kids, I want you guys to look up here and listen to this. On the bottom of your worship guide that I know your parents are going to go over and continue the conversation when you leave today, the final thing on there says, for kids, I want you to look at your parents. Kids, are y'all paying attention? All the kids are looking at me. Say, I'm looking at you. Scream it out. Sweet. Thank you. All right, cool. All right, here we go. Here's what I want you to ask your parents. How can, how can we love our neighbors better this week? Remember, who's our neighbors? Everybody. All right, so don't just limit it to the person next door, but it can be the person next door. How can we love our neighbors better this week? And is there any idea that you and your parents can come up with to show the love of Jesus to somebody this week? So kids, listen, when y'all get in the car today, don't you let your parents off the hook. You sit there with them and you go, how are we going to love people better this week? Mommy, tell me how we're going to do this. I want to be a part of it. Dad, I want to help out. How can we love people better this week? Parents, y'all are like, we are never coming to a family Sunday again. All right, yeah, you are too. All right, get involved with it. See what God can do. A few months ago, this idea of bless, um, I ran across it. And I thought, man, that's, that's what I want our church to be. And I've been carrying a little three by five card or leaving it sitting on my desk, one or the other. And I wrote our acrostic this way. Begin with prayer. Listen with care. Engage with intention. Serve with love. And share your story. I can do one of those every single day. And if I invest in the relationship, eventually I'll get to do all five of them. That is living a life that is sin. Man, join us in the weeks to come as we walk through this and we help teach you and you help learn for yourself. You don't have to memorize a bunch of verses. It's cool if you got a few of them in memory. Um, It actually says they're good. They keep sin out of your life. But you don't have to memorize all the right verses and know all the right things to say. Just look for people to bless. Maybe this morning you're, you're not sure about this Jesus thing and this church thing and this idea of being a witness for God. You can't be a witness because you never experienced it. 
And that's God saying to you, I want you to be my child this morning. I want you to give your life to Jesus this morning. That's where it starts. No greater hope, no greater peace. Easter every day of your life, minus the ham. Um, Giving your life to Jesus. That's where I'd want you to start. If you are a Christian this morning, I would ask that you walk out of here and say, I want to bless others. And then come join us in the weeks to come as we dig in further into this and realize what it is to live a life that is sent for God. Will you pray with me? God, I love you this morning. Thank you for the opportunity. God, I always say that, but I really am grateful for an opportunity to share um, what you put on my heart, what's in your word. God, this entire year feels like it's just been a progression from praying and fasting over what our church can be to dedicating ourselves to praying dangerous prayers moving through uh, an Old Testament book of Ezra that reminded us over and over again to trust you and to follow you and to recognize that you have you think more of us than we think of ourselves. And then God stepping into this next thing after Easter and recognizing that Easter isn't the end of the story. Easter is the beginning of the story that we're supposed to tell. God, will you challenge me, challenge our church, God, I pray and I believe with all of my heart that if we will live a life that is sent, God, we won't be able to contain the people that will be coming to you. God, we'll be sending people on missions. We'll be, we'll be planting churches. We'll be seeing lives changed. We'll be seeing people healed. We'll be seeing people recovering from things in their life. Um, God, we just have to live lives that are sent. Help us do that. That's my heart. God, we love you. In your name we pray, amen.